In the last video, we talked about how the cell membrane is fluid in the fluid mosaic model. This is important so structures embedded within the membrane can move and also make the cell membrane porous enough so that substances can diffuse through it. But when it comes to the cell membrane, the balancing of fluidity must be taken into account. It must be fluid enough for some substances to move, but not so fluid that it loses its structural integrity and falls apart. This basis of membrane fluidity is dictated by the chemical properties of the fatty acids that make up the membrane. We call that phospholipids are the core structural component of the cell membrane, and attached to their hydrophilic heads are hydrophobic fatty acid tails. These tails can either be saturated or unsaturated in terms of the amount of hydrogen they have, which is based on the bonding of the carbon atoms within the chain. If each carbon atom is connected with a single bond in the fatty acid chain, then it can be saturated with hydrogen atoms to fill the remaining two bonds that carbon can make. This results in the straight fatty acid chain, which can be packed together tightly, making the cell membrane more rigid and less permeable to simple diffusion. Unsaturated fatty acids contain some carbon to carbon double bonds, and as a result have less hydrogen atoms, as now each of the double bonded carbon atoms only need one hydrogen to complete their fourth bond. This unsaturated structure has a bent shape which takes up more space and does not allow the phospholipids to be packed together as tightly compared to the saturated form. This makes the membrane less rigid but more permeable. The balance of membrane fluidity is then dictated by the ratio of saturated and unsaturated fatty acid chains of phospholipids. The ideal ratio is usually dictated by external factors like temperature. If an organism lives in a cold environment, like the Atlantic cod for example, where particles are moving slowly within their cells, they usually have a higher concentration of unsaturated fatty acids, which makes their cell membranes more permeable to be able to move under the colder condition. In addition to the types of fatty acids that make up the membrane, cholesterol also plays an important role in fluidity and basic stability. Cholesterol is a lipid molecule classified as a steroid. Steroids have a unique structure based around four interconnected rings of carbon atoms. Cholesterol as a molecule is largely hydrophobic, with one small hydroxyl group that is hydrophilic. This makes it easy for the majority of the molecule to sit within the membrane core next to the phospholipid tails. Cholesterol helps support the structure and function of the cell membrane under both warm and cold conditions. If the cell membrane were to get too hot, the phospholipids could become too permeable to exterior particles, letting anything pass through. The cholesterol in the membrane helps support the core to keep other substances from passing through under these conditions, ensuring it is still selective. Under colder temperatures, where movement of particles is slower, the addition of cholesterol between the phospholipid tails helps to reduce stiffening of the membrane, ensuring that the tails do not solidify and substances can still pass through the membrane. At this point, we know that certain substances can move directly through the membrane via simple diffusion or move through protein channels or pumps via facilitated diffusion or active transport. But the cell membrane can support other types of movement both into and out of the cell at a larger scale using vesicles. A vesicle is a small, independent enclosure of liquid completely surrounded by a lipid bilayer, aka a membrane. So, they are structures made out of cell membrane components that can therefore easily fuse with the cell membrane when needed. If a cell needs to take in a pocket of liquid from outside of the cell, certain proteins can be triggered to start the process of pinching a piece of cell membrane off that contains that extracellular fluid, creating an internal vesicle that can be moved around the cell. This is a process that requires cellular energy in the form of ATP to complete. And because the cells are bringing outside components in, we call this process endocytosis. In the reverse, the cell can also expel waste products that are packed within vesicles to be moved out of the cell. In this case, the membrane of the vesicles will fuse with a larger cell membrane and push the components to the outside. This process also requires energy and is called exocytosis. The membrane of the vesicle will then permanently become part of the larger cell membrane which is the exact process of how cells can grow the size of their membrane, having vesicles fuse to add phospholipids. In the last video, we discussed protein channels that supported the facilitated diffusion of substances across the cell membrane. For the higher level IB curriculum, you need to know a few specific examples of these types of channels and how they work. Much of the information we will discuss on this slide and the next slide will come back in section C2.2, Neural Signaling.
The specific focus here is on neurons, which are specialized cells that make up our nervous system, which encompasses our brain and spinal cord. To understand how the protein channels and the membrane of neurons work, we first need to recall that neurons send electrical signals to function. The emphasis here is on electrical signals, which are dictated by the movement of charged ions like sodium and potassium. When a neuron is resting, and therefore not sending an electrical signal, we find a high concentration of sodium ions on the outside of the cell, and a high concentration of potassium ions on the inside of the cell, along with other negatively charged proteins that exist inside of the cell. Neurons have separate protein channels for both sodium and potassium, which allow them to diffuse through the membrane. But these channels are not always open, and only open based on the internal voltage of the neuron. If the internal voltage of the neuron is very negatively charged, around negative 70 millivolts, both the sodium and potassium channels remain closed. If the internal voltage raises above negative 55 millivolts, it will trigger a conformational change in any adjacent sodium channel, causing them to open and support the facilitated diffusion of sodium ions to move inside the cell along a high to low concentration gradient. Because sodium ions are positively charged, the opening of their channels and movement into the cell membrane will further increase the internal voltage of the cell. When the internal voltage reaches around 30 millivolts, the potassium channels go through a conformational change to open. This releases the high concentration of potassium ions to the outside of the cell via facilitated diffusion. The movement of these positively charged potassium ions will decrease the internal voltage of the cell back down into the negatives, causing both the sodium and potassium ion channels to close. At this point, the neuron has sent the electrical signal down the cell, which was the movement of those sodium ions. Eventually, these sodium and potassium ions will get back to where they started to be ready to send another signal, which we will talk about more on the next slide. In addition to the sodium-potassium voltage-gated ion channels of the neuron, you also need to know about nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. These receptors exist at a synapse, or a small space between two neurons, in which chemicals can be passed. It's important to note here that this receptor is not gated by internal voltage like the sodium and potassium channels, but by the presence and attachment of a chemical. In this case, with this specific receptor, the neurotransmitter chemical acetylcholine can bind to it, in addition to the chemical nicotine, hence the name nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. If either of these chemicals bind to the protein receptor, it changes conformation and opens up, allowing ions like sodium to pass through via facilitated diffusion across the cell membrane. The influx of this sodium will subsequently increase the internal voltage, which can impact the other gated ion channels we discussed earlier. The binding of these chemicals to the receptor is reversible, and when it detaches, the channel changes conformation to close. In the last video, we discussed active transport and protein pumps, like the sodium-potassium pump, which we need to mention here again because its importance with building concentration gradients for neurons to send their electrical signals. Recall that on the last slide, we ended the electrical signal movement with the voltage-gated channels with sodium on the inside of the neuron and potassium ions on the outside of the neuron. In order for the neuron to send the electrical signal again, these ions need to be moved back to their starting gradients, which is a high concentration of sodium on the outside of the cell and a high concentration of potassium on the inside. As you already know, this is achieved by the protein pump called the sodium-potassium pump, which uses energy to move three sodium ions out of the cell for every two potassium ions it moves in. This allows an electrochemical concentration gradient to be built so when the neuron is ready to send another signal, those voltage-gated channels can open up again and the ions can flow down their respective gradients via facilitated diffusion. And then to reset the process again, the sodium-potassium pump will exchange the ions to rebuild the gradients. We can also call this pump an exchange transporter, as it works correctly by exchanging one type of ion, sodium, moving out, for another ion, potassium, moving in. Both ions need to be exchanged for the pump to continue to function. Moving on to other types of membrane transport, there is another type of transport you need to know for the higher level curriculum, which is called co-transport. Co-transport is a type of active transport, which means energy is being used, that supports the movement of two molecules across the membrane together in unison. The example that you need to know is the sodium-dependent glucose co-transporter. In this scenario, a sodium ion is moved down a concentration gradient with a glucose molecule that is moved against its concentration gradient via this specific glucose co-transporter channel. 
This is a type of indirect active transport because the energy released from the sodium ion moving down its concentration gradient from high to low is greater than the energy needed for the glucose to move against its concentration gradient from low to high. And for this reason, these substances can co-transport across the membrane together. This co-transporter is found within the tissue of the small intestine and the kidneys. The small intestine absorbs glucose from the food we consume, and the nephron reabsorbs any glucose found in the filtering process so that it is not lost as waste into our urine. We'll discuss both of these concepts in more detail in other videos. In addition to controlling transport, cell membranes also have the ability to connect to the membrane of another adjacent cell, which holds the two cells together. This is essentially how tissues within multicellular organisms are formed. They are separate cells of the same type held together by their membranes and will often serve the same function together. The links between cells are called junctions, and the junctions are made by specific molecules embedded in the cell membrane called cell adhesion molecules, abbreviated as CAMs. There are many different types of CAMs that can hold membranes together. Some even allow for the passageway of substances to move from one cell to another, while others actively prevent the same type of movement. You do not need to know any specific examples of CAMs for the IB exam, just know that they are components found embedded within the cell membrane that extend outward to form a junction with another adjacent cell.